I don't, yep, okay. Yeah. Are we there? We're there. I just don't believe it. Okay. <laughs> Unlucky number seven. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. It's, it's Monday night. It is September 28th, 2020. And here I am with my friend Clay Ackerley, Dr. Clay Ackerley, to discuss the latest and greatest on COVID and to answer your questions. Clay, thank you so much for joining me on the seventh Q&A with Lucy and Clay. Sorry, the, the technical difficulties of us a starting a little bit late and then I realized for the first time I was listening to <laughs> the live stream. I don't know if you heard the feedback on the live stream coming back, but- Did you hear the it, feedback? Oh dear. I, I heard myself. Uh, it's great to be here. <laughs> Ray, great to be here. An auspicious start to the Monday, the week. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay, so so let's talk about. Um, are you hearing feedback? Not anymore. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what people have, what questions they have to ask. But let's open with. Well, how about? Tell me what you're seeing in your patients, what patients are asking you, because I can tell you I've seen a couple of COVID patients, actually more than a few COVID patients yeah. in the last two weeks. So so what, what are you seeing in, in, on your end of the, the hall over there? Yeah, I think it is the, <clears throat> the tale of two cities um, in the sense of it's the best of times for some people who are really pushing forward and feeling good about how things are and and getting back to school if they can, coming back from vacations, refilling the tank. Uh, and it's also the, the worst of times at the same time in that I am seeing more COVID patients. So I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know what to make of it right now other than I am concerned, but the numbers look good despite seeing patients in my own practice who are now catching COVID, All right? The yeah. public numbers in the region look pretty good and so that's reassuring and all of the things that we've been optimistic, optimistic about in terms of progress on testing, progress on treatments, uh, progress on vaccines as I've said from the start, I'm trying to tune out because it's gonna be a while before there's any actionable information. There's gonna be a lot of noise about which vaccines are gonna you know, be approved when and what supply to be provided to whom. So I do believe that there's future in the vaccine. So I'm optimistic in terms of the basic science pushing forward. I have this concern at the back of my mind through a couple of examples of my patients who are now uh, testing positive for COVID that something is going on. Yeah. I mean, I think people have natural pandemic fatigue. People are letting their guard down because I think people are feeling a little more comfortable. Um, I think if you don't know someone who's had COVID, you don't have a family member who's had COVID, um, it's easy to be a little complacent, understandably. We're human beings, we're social, we want to get out, the weather's been nice, we want to, you know, let our hair down a little bit. We hear about the coming twin-demic, which is the media's favorite way of, you know, scaring us about the upcoming fall, which may be actually, you know, legitimate, but I think I think people are letting their guard down a little bit, and we very well know that the the virus loves it when we commingle in small spaces indoors and up close. And so the patients that I've seen who have been positive for COVID in the last two weeks, not surprisingly, um, have gotten it for non mysterious ways. They've gotten it because they've been up close, you know, closer than six feet indoors in poorly ventilated spaces. Um, so I do worry that as the weather gets cooler and people are inside more, we're going to see an uptick in cases. It's possible, as you and I were saying, you know, before the show started, that if we were to double down on the risk mitigation factors to, to limit the, the spread of um, coronavirus, we would also limit the spread of flu because it spreads the exact same way. Yep. Exactly. I mean, I think that, yeah, the, the, the twin demics is, uh, I think, a little bit of concern is appropriate to make sure people get you know, their flu vaccine and are taking it seriously. I do have optimism that this will also be one of the lightest flu seasons in a long time, just given people taking the social distancing mask wearing seriously. And even if it's not universal and it's not enough to stop COVID from coming back, 
it should be enough to blunt the effect of influenza. But influenza, while not here yet, will almost certainly be here at some level. So we do need to be careful. Yeah, people ask me all the time, like, what do you see if you look in your crystal ball? When are we getting out of this? Um, and the answer is, I really don't know. Um, you and I have talked over the over the last seven months about our predictions for perhaps the spring of 2021 looking a little bit better. Um, so I don't exactly have a time frame in mind, though I do think 2021 spring summer is going to look a lot better than it does now. Um, I think of it as like a horse race with all these horses running simultaneously to the finish line where one horse is widespread, you know, cheap testing with good turnaround times. The next horse is the vaccines, which we will have a few of, I think, by 2021. The next is therapeutics, so treatments for mild to moderate illness, people who do not need to be hospitalized, but who are mildly ill to prevent hospitalization. Yeah. And then the next horse is doubling down on the preventative measures. Um, and I think as we, as we go forward, we're sort of watching these four, and maybe there are five or six players kind of simultaneously edge forward. And I'm hoping that, I, I, I don't actually think that there's gonna be one thing that changes the, um, the game. I think it's not gonna be like one vaccine that then makes us all okay, or one therapeutic that's gonna make us all okay. I think all of those things together are gonna to coalesce and allow us to move more freely about the world. Um, I, I don't know what you think about what's gonna like come first, a vaccine, widespread testing, or you know, herd immunity, which I think to me is a, is a far way off, is a long way off. No, it's also a very dangerous thing to, to shoot for. I think of those horses in, in the metaphorical race, yeah. there's some that are important from a system perspective, and there's some yeah. that are more important for an individual perspective and how they choose to live their day-to-day -day lives. And I do think that vaccines are sort of out of our hands right now. But yeah. people who are interested in it sign up for trials. They're continuing to, you, know, you may not get the actual vaccine. You may get a placebo, but it's important to help advance science. So there are plenty of websites. If you just Google, you know, it's COVID Prevention Network. I think there are other websites up to enroll in clinical trials. You can sort of get ahead if you're really, really interested in playing a part in the science of vaccine development. Uh, the treatments too, the hope is you'll never need them, right? So, but there is advancing science there. We are getting better at um, preventing death and morbidity from this. And it's not all there yet, but we are getting better slowly. In terms of how you behave day to day, I think there is this interesting mix of testing and um, uh, preventive measures, mask wearing, distancing, et cetera. The challenge with testing right now is it's not entirely clear how to integrate that, right? The access to testing, the turnaround time for testing, I'd love for us to have the rapid daily access to testing. If you know you need to do a high risk activity and in terms of seeing someone who's high risk, test yourself, you'll know you'll be good for the next 24 hours, even if you're in the early incubation period. And that can open up a lot of things you may not otherwise want to do or take some risks and say, I'm coming back home from a business trip that you have to take or a family trip that you really need to take. Then, you know, surrounding that sort of risky activity with testing can blunt the impact on the pandemic overall. Um, the thing that I'm really worried about right now though is on the behavior side that there is the fatigue mm -hmm. right and i believe that we're coming out of a summer of potentially um, i'd say suboptimal behaviors that have been reinforced through luck right um i don't love the following analogy i think i may have said it before but if you just think of russian roulette Oh my gosh, a, I've been using the Russian roulette analogy too. Yeah, so you put a bullet in a chamber, you spin it, and if you shoot it, you know, pull the trigger two, three times, and no bullet goes off, you don't, pulling the trigger with a, with a bullet, you know, is not a good idea. You just happen to get lucky that you didn't get sick, right? And there, you know, and I think there are a lot of people who have been taking risks, so they, you know, for their mental health purposes, they, they have to, 
Um, but we need to invest in resilience to cut this. I mean, this, this fall and winter, as the days get shorter, as it gets colder outside, we need to find ways to maintain those best practices that we know if you maintain them, you will be safe. Yep. And you were saying this weekend, we were talking about investing in resilience and investing in space heaters. Yes. Um, because <laughs> one way to prolong your ability to socialize with some of your loved ones is to be outside as long as possible. So get a good coat, get from Home Depot, like a, some sort of fire pit. Um, we just got some space heaters. My husband and son spent like seven hours assembling one of them this weekend so that we can sit outside and potentially safely hang out with neighbors six feet apart with masks because, you know, we, we want to be able to socialize. We want to be able to, to, you know, act a little bit like normal human beings who are wired for connection and, you know, social life. But at the end of the day, the virus has not changed one bit since it landed in the United States. It's that human behaviors have, and as you said, we're getting a little bit inured to the risk. You, if you've been lucky enough not to get sick yourself, not to know anyone who, who, who's, who's gotten sick, you can start to think, if you take one risk, then why not take another risk and take another risk? But there's this concept of cumulative risk, right? Where, you know, every risk you take adds, it's additive. It's not that, you know, taking a risk means that you are therefore entitled to take another risk or you're gonna be safe from taking another risk. Um, so it's tricky. Um, Absolutely, and I think there's the, the early on, I feel like the peer pressure aspect of all that was really high and it is yeah. now coming back. I think people got into a particular groove and now I think they're gonna see a lot of peer pressure again. Um, especially as elements of small pods maybe be beginning to make different decisions. How are those pods, you know, splitting up with schools and what that means it is, um, that's tough. Okay, we got a couple of questions coming in, Dr. Agley. Right. What do we know yet about whether the novel coronavirus sticks around in our systems, like herpes simplex, herpes zoster, which as we know, lives in our system forever and then comes out in you know, flare-ups. Um, as far as we know, coronavirus is not like that at all. Coronavirus um, comes, it gets attacked by our immune system and then goes. Um, it doesn't lay dormant in our system for a long time, as far as we know. And so that is absolutely the understanding. I think it's a fascinating question because there are a number of examples of where that may not be the case. Right. Right. And the question is, what, what's the rule versus what's the exception to the rule and how common is that exception? I think there was an article, and I forget in which uh, science newsletter, that covered this really interesting example, and I forget in which decade, maybe it was in the 60s or 70s, where a group of individuals down in Antarctica, right, were there. And did you see this article? No, about COVID? It wasn't about COVID, it was about coronaviruses and cold viruses. Oh, no, I didn't see that. Right, which in cold viruses aren't thought to lay dormant. But they were down there for seven months, and they, they had not been interacting with the outside world at all. Then one person ended up developing cold symptoms and everybody else in that group ended up catching colds, quote unquote, right? So how is that possible? And, and I think there's now some, some early work into seeing what those mechanisms might be. Are there people who perhaps don't have it laying dormant like um, herpes simplex or the chickenpox virus but have a little bit up and down, up and down, up and down, maybe in a different mechanism. And then suddenly your immune system, you know, is weak and then the virus comes back. So I think you're completely right in that that's the, the, the normal medical judgment is that that's not the case with the seasonal coronaviruses, probably not what's going on with COVID at this point. But it's fascinating to think about what we're gonna learn um, about coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and other viruses, given the amount of focus that's now being paid to it. And a, a corollary to that question is someone else is asking, after the initial discussion of some people getting COVID twice, 
has this become something you've seen frequently? And Clay was one of the first people to report the a patient who seemingly had coronavirus twice. Um, and after you had that very fascinating case, um, it was reported again and again. I mean, not that many times, but but people were actually isolating separate. Do I say strains of the of coronavirus that um, yeah. that seemed to have infected an individual or two, you know, separately, multiple times? Exactly. So I think they they were able to prove it. Where for my patient we couldn't. Right. And that they were infected uh, with two separate strains. And and yeah, I think honestly it's probably a rare event, right? It's probably rare. I'm not seeing a ton of it. Uh, I certainly, that's the only patient that I've had who's had, caught it twice. And it's not like I have hundreds and hundreds of COVID patients. So, you know, we will see over time, I, I can tell you with fair certainty that it's possible. Yeah. And we don't know enough about our immune response to COVID to know if you've had it once, like, are you in the clear? I think there's enough. And part of the reason why I felt compelled to tell his story was sort of people who have caught it to not let their guard down. Yeah. I had a patient this, no, what day is it? It's only, it's only Monday. Um, I had a patient last week who had COVID back in July. And so when he came in to me for his annual checkup last week, he asked for a COVID antibody level. And I said, you know, do you really want to get it? It doesn't have that much meaning. He wanted to get it. So we did the antibody test. We have this test at our, at our office. Um, and his antibody test came back nice and positive, a robust, it was like a 6.5, yeah. um, which is a nice robust antibody response, which means that his immune system mounted the appropriate antibodies, the proteins that are these little soldiers that fight infection, um, which is, you know, we think in, in part why he recovered so nicely from coronavirus. And so he asked me, so can I not get coronavirus again? Like, am I protected? Is this a, is this a, is this a, is this a hall pass? And I said, no, um, you can still transmit virus. You can still carry it and transmit it to other people. But I, I did say you're probably not going to get infected for the next, we think, three to six months, but we just don't know. So we just don't know. We have a lot more to we learn. Don't know. We don't know. Um, agreed. And I think it's just not worth those risks. It's certainly not a hall pass. Can you feel a little confident that if you were to get it, you probably won't get really sick? Probably. I would probably know. feel pretty good. I'd rather have an antibody than not. Yeah, because I think it goes back to some of the concerns with with my telling the story of, of my patient and these other patients is that if the natural immune response to being exposed to the virus is not effective, then are there concerns about the vaccine uh, process not working either? And I do believe that the vaccines that are being developed will work in the vast majority of cases. So yeah. Um, um, someone's asking here, what's the current thinking about whether the virus can be transmitted on surfaces? It's a great question. I get this question all the time. You know, back in March, I, perhaps like you, was wa I was washing down my, you know, gallon of milk and my Diet Cokes in the sink, and then like sanitizing my hand sanitizer, um, my bottle of hand sanitizer. I'm no longer doing that because we have learned over the last seven months that service transmission, while not impossible, is extremely unlikely and and low in the sort of pie chart of, of 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 ways that which the the virus is transmitted it's largely transmitted person to person through droplets and aerosols that are these that are these droplets that kind of hang in the air for longer than a larger droplet so i still tell patients to wash their hands practice you know, sort of like good hand hygiene try not to touch their face but you do not need to let your mail sit in your front hall for a day your groceries sit in the front hall for a day, your Amazon packages, you don't need to wipe them down. You just need to wash your hands after you open the packages. Yep. Is that fair? Totally agree. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely a minor cause. And I do think while it hasn't been proven in the data that I've seen, I do believe that logic would suggest that if you do catch it from that method, it'd be a lot less severe. Right? Yeah. The amount of virus that you can take into your body from contact is low and we know in a lot of other instances, how the amount of virus you happen, the size of the inoculate, the viral really load. does matter. The load, the viral load matters of what you take in and it's hard. 
that's my concern with indoors, crowded places. If there happens to be someone who's spreading, you can. And I think the aerosol aspect of this is becoming increasingly clear despite the controversy of what the CDC said, didn't said, didn't say all that. We, we know and we've known for a while this is part of the way it transmits. And if you get a lot of virus deep into your lungs, you know, the likelihood of you having a more severe respiratory response is, is, is high. So I agree. Can you speak a little bit about testing specifically if a person tests negative for a COVID to test, t test negatively for, for COVID today, could they be contagious tomorrow or the next day? So this is one of my favorite subjects, testing. So just like a pregnancy test wouldn't be positive the day after, it takes at least three to five days after an exposure to coronavirus for a test to be positive. Even the most sensitive tests won't be positive until that incubation period has passed. So if you're, if you're exposed to someone with coronavirus on a Saturday or potentially with coronavirus on a Saturday, I would not try to get tested until maybe that Tuesday or Wednesday. And still the tests are not 100% accurate, depends on what test you're trying to get. Certainly if you do not have symptoms, if you're asymptomatic, the tests are less sensitive or less, le or they're less accurate than if you have symptoms. If you have symptoms, the tests are more accurate because your pretest probability is, is higher. Yeah. Um, so if someone has a known exposure, I am telling them at a minimum to wait three days, ideally five days to get tested. I'm having them do a PCR test. And if the PCR test is negative, I still have them quarantined for the full 14 days because if you had a high risk contact, it can take up to 14 days for you to be infected. So whether or not you have a, 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 a test that's negative during the 14 days, you still have to quarantine for that 14 days. Yeah, that, that's the problem. So I don't really know what to recommend to my patients. I think you're right. If, if, if they're determined to get tested, they yep. wait at least three days. Um, some of the average, you know, when you start getting symptomatic, right, the five, seven, eight day range. So you definitely need to wait. And your point about getting the PCR test and not the rapid tests, because it'd be more sensitive to the small amounts of virus as the virus builds up in your system. But it doesn't give you a free pass at all. And so possibly if you have a high risk contact, you're now in the 14 day incubation period, maybe a rapid test for maybe a possibly medium risk activity for that day may make some sense. Right. right? And I agree. I mean, I think, I think the PCR tests are more sensitive, but it still takes a couple of days to come back. And by that time, you'll probably need another test and then another test. So it's tough. And that's why it's almost tougher on the people who are contacts of patients because they have to wait the entire 14 days versus those people who are actively sick with a diagnosis, <laughs> you know, have the, the 10 day, you know, rule um, or the 24 hours, right? It's still 24 hours, right? After resolution of uh, symptoms. Without. It's 24 hours. Yeah. So a question I get a lot is, you know, do I have to quarantine for a full 14 days? Was my contact high risk enough to warrant a full court yep. 14 days? Or, you know, because I've just been living my life, I've been going to some restaurants, I've been seeing some friends, like what's my risk and when should I get tested and how long should I quarantine? So the CDC defines a close contact as someone who has been closer than six feet um, for more than 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so if you have a household contact who's positive for coronavirus, then presumably, you know, you have been within six feet from, the, from that person for more than 15 minutes, you automatically need to quarantine for 14 days, regardless of what your test comes back. If you come back positive, you need to, to start the clock at 10 days and isolate for 10. If your test is negative after contacting that household positive case, you still need to quarantine for the full 14 days. But, you know, it, it, there are so many nuances to every human encounter that, you know, it's hard to tell every single person to quarantine for 14 days with a possible exposure. Like if you go on an airplane yep. and you don't know that the person next to you was positive, should you still quarantine for 14 days? 
The answer is I'm trying to I'm trying to err on the side of caution and say yes, you should quarantine for a full 14 days. If you're coming back from California after you've been on an airplane, I would quarantine for 14 days before you entered, you know, circulation with other people. Um, but how are you handling these sort of more nuanced situations, Clay, with your with your patients? Because there's so many un situations and people are moving about more and more. No, it's hard, and I think that's as much as we can reduce those movements. I think we're in this dangerous phase of a lot of people moving more with these long incubation periods. Um, so we need to be careful. I think the point of how difficult it is is a good one. I had a patient today who picked up his son who was positive from the airport. Ooh. It was a 30 minute drive, but they were both wearing masks. And then the test came back positive for his son. And it was, po and the test came back positive. They were wearing masks, it was indoors, didn't technically meet the CDC criteria, but how well? That's a high you know, what risk. Was the quality of, what was the quality of the mask? How well were they, you know, wearing it? How high was, you know, were the windows open really? So I said, you need to be careful and you should quarantine for 14 days. And, you know, and I had the exact same issue. When do we test again? It's, it's hard. And we just need to err on the side of caution as much as we possibly can because there are now more, there's more and more gray zone with more and more movement of people slipping through the cracks and getting in contact with more individuals. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically adv advocating that my patients sort of, and, and my, my family members and people, um, my friends, you know, sort of act as if everybody has COVID. Yep. Walk around like everybody in your orbit has COVID. The person who is walking by you at the grocery store, the person who you know, you sit adjacent to in the outdoor restaurant, um, not to be, you know, crazy, but just to behave in a way that is uber, uber cautious. So making sure you stay six feet, making sure you keep your mask on unless you're eating or drinking and then put your mask back on when you're not eating or drinking um, and be outside, avoid crowded indoor spaces. I mean, we know how to mitigate the risk. Um, I think, we just need to double down on those risk mitigation measures yeah, and it. assume that people have COVID because we just Correct. don't know. Correct. It's the shortcuts. You're trying to find a shortcut. That's where you're going to get burned. Yep. And I think if you assume that you have it, right, in the way you behave with others and you presume that other people have it in the way that you behave, but you put those systems in place with some social distancing, good mask wearing and hygiene, everything's going to be fine. Yep. You're and right. I think there, there was um, a question here about flying. Yeah, and, flying. Uh, with, yeah, with masks and face shields. I think there's now been a couple of cases coming out showing more uh, clearly what we would have expected otherwise in terms of COVID spreading on airplanes. So it does happen. And I think if you've got a nice face mask on with a good face shield on, practicing hand hygiene, given the amount of air filtration that happens on an airplane, it's a reasonably safe thing to do if you have to do it. Yep. If you have to do it and you're really worried about catching COVID, my guess is going out the other side, you're not gonna catch it on that airplane. If that's the case, we would have heard about it by now as being a frequent hotspot. And it's not a frequent hotspot, but there are plenty of people who are catching COVID on airplanes. Yep. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, if the ventilation systems on, on planes are better than we had thought, I think, um, but let's face it, if you sit next to somebody or even two seats over from somebody who's sick, you know, that adds to your risk and you don't know who's sick when you're, when you're getting on that plane. Um, okay, so workout classes, someone was asking about a workout class outside, but not six feet apart. So, you know, the ideal situation is to layer the, the risk mitigation elements on top of one another. So being outside and six feet apart and masking and, you know, hand hygiene precautions. Um, you know, if you're outside and you're wearing a mask and you're five feet apart or four feet apart, you're probably better than if you're indoors and four feet apart. But just know that every time you cheat so to speak, on those risk mitigation measures, you're adding risk. I do feel, I don't know, I mean, just scientifically, I know it to be true, but also just emotionally, like I feel so much safer outside than I do inside. So um, I don't know, if, if you have a yoga mat that's four foot from the four feet from the other person, I just scoot it over two feet and feel a little bit safer. Yeah, I mean, if it's outdoors, I think that's probably reasonable. I think this question had a really good second part to it. 
seeing lots of people attending these outdoor classes makes me nervous, but I'm also feeling jealous. Yeah, I told it's so well said. Yeah. And yeah. I totally get it. And but just because they're doing it doesn't make it a good idea. You don't need we don't need judgment. People are making these decisions independently. I think there are some challenges when we get to the point where there's limitations on personal protective equipment and hospitals get full again. And then I think the level of personal responsibility is even higher to be completely safe. But some people are going to make bad decisions and that's okay. And it's what they're taking on themselves and then their families. And it's, it's, it's not great. Um, but I totally understand the feeling of jealousy and envy and at the end of the day, I think we're going to get to the other side of this in not too long. It's been seven months. I do think in six, seven months, we're going to be in a very, very different place. Yep. I really do. Even though Fauci is even saying we're not going to get back to normalcy until the end of 2021, you stack, as we've talked about, better access to testing, continued improvements on treatment, the beginnings of vaccines getting into people. I do think that we can begin to get back to normalcy faster than that. I agree. It's like, I, I don't, I never disagree with Fauci and, and no one has a crystal ball, but I, I, I just see on the horizon, as you said, developments that are going to let us liberalize a little bit sooner than the end of 2021. But yeah. um, how important is it for family members in the household to isolate from one another if they have symptoms? I think that's a great question because as you and I both know, Clay, um, and I think many people watching know, the, 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 the household transmission is one of the, the biggest sources for, for illness. So, you know, it's very hard to isolate from one another in a household. And some people just physically can't, right? If you live in and seeing these outbreaks in apartment complexes and places where people can't physically distance. But if you have someone in your family who is symptomatic with anything from a runny nose, you know, sore throat, headache, body aches, it's, 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 it's ideal and optimal to isolate that person fully from the rest of the family until that person gets tested or evaluated by a doctor and, and, and we know better what those symptoms are. Of course, if it's COVID and you've had contact with that person, then the other family members need to quarantine for 14 full days regardless of test. Yep. Um, yeah, and I think the something is better than nothing do the very best you can is important in this regard. So yep. I do I do worry just like I think space heaters are gonna sell out, indoor HEPA filters um, are important in reducing the amount of potential viral particles in the air. Yep. And so if that's something that can be utilized in a home that's got someone who's COVID positive, but every step matters. Even if there are two people, I've got a couple who have COVID and I'm encouraging them actually to separate. Now that's not evidence-based at all, but I have a just gut sense that if one person has more virus than the other and they're doing a good job beating it, exposing that individual who's on the improvement side of this to more virus, one would expect that they could handle it okay, but they may not. And that may, so reducing the amount, or it's even the person who's doing better gives the person who's doing poorly just that much extra virus to kick him down the wrong path. So right. you no, know, it's not evidence-based at all, but even with family members who all have COVID, doing their best to reduce the amount of virus they're giving to each other is possibly useful. Right, and if, you know, of course, if you have to be caregiving for someone in your home who has COVID, um, you know, you wanna wear a mask, you wanna hand wash, you wanna, you know, deliver them their food and medication and then skedaddle as much as possible but your quarantining of 14 days starts, it kind of restarts the clock every day that you're exposed to that person. So it starts, you know, the last day that you've been in contact with that person in their, in their you know, contagious phase, which is a full 10 days. Yeah. And if then you get sick or test positive for COVID yourself as the caregiver or household contact, your clock starts at 10 days yeah. and you need to isolate for 10 days. So you know, you can see why households are, you know, major sources of transmission and why, you know, the best practice is to really lock down the family if someone gets sick in the house, isolate that individual and then everybody else quarantine and Correct. keep their distance if possible. 
Yeah, and I think the 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 issue of the caregiver is is a great one. And if you look at the evidence about the efficacy of masking, yeah, and how good it is, yeah, right. There's a lot of this evidence is coming from healthcare settings where people were doing universal masking. You know, early on, I mean, very very few caregivers in hospitalized patients are getting COVID. Right, and they don't need the N95. Even the surgical mask helps a great deal. And there was a study that just came out in the last couple of weeks about asking patients in rooms to wear a surgical mask, and that reduced the amount of virus that was spread within the room. Right. So another thing to even think about: yes, that poor person. <laughs> um, but before the caregiver comes in, is the COVID sick person puts on a mask as well. Right. Um, that can also help keep uh, the caregivers in the family uh, safe. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, so any other like, I mean, these are great questions people are asking. I mean, we could keep, oh, someone's asking about Halloween. Halloween. Let's talk about Halloween for oh, a second. No. I love Halloween. I love oh, candy Halloween. corn. You and I are both born in October. So that's my theory on why we love the fall so much. <laughs> it's it's so interesting. <laughs> But I love Halloween, candy corn, bobbing for apples, the crisp fall air. What is Halloween gonna look like this year? Um, you know, I have some, some, some th different thoughts about it. One thought is like, you know, why do something that's risky at all? Just stay home and, you know, watch more TV. And then the other side of the coin is, you know, these are like, these are sort of like traditions in the American lifestyle. This is a this is a kid friendly holiday. It's outside, you know. Yeah. Kids are wearing masks by definition. You know, could we? Depends on the costume. But yes, yes. Could we? <laughs> could we mitigate risk and still enjoy ourselves a little bit? Um, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, there is candy that's being touched and kids touching their faces. And what do you think about that? I think I think the answer is yes and yes. But I think we do need to be careful about those rules of engagement are. And at the end of the day, with those rules of engagement in place, is that an enjoyable thing for children to do? <laughs> my son is only two, so I honestly don't know. Um, I have to go back to my own experience to say what part of that Halloween experience was the most fun for me. But getting dressed up, having a small social pod, walking through the neighborhood, and if there are people who have left out bowls of candy and you pick up the bowls of candy and you let it sit at the end of the day for 24 hours, you wash your hands when you get home, you know, and then you may find creative uh, costumes that do protect the face. Yeah. I mean, were you the kid that could wait 24 hours to eat his candy? I mean, I wasn't. I don't know. Crazy. I mean, have, 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 have a, again, I think we started early in the conversation. We talked about how contact is a, it's unlikely, not that, but I think you want to be prudent. Yeah. And, and say, okay, fine. Is there a family stash of candy? that's held in reserve that you give until the next day and say, you know what, um, <laughs> just, just wait. I don't, again, I haven't thought about it enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this, I think there's gotta be a way to make it. There's gotta be a way. Out. I mean, my kids are old enough. I mean, I have one in college and two in high school where, you know, it's basically like a social event. And so I'm not sure that that's ideal. <laughs> Um, <laughs> True. And, th and then I'm also thinking about as a parent, as a parent, when my kids were younger, part of the appeal of Halloween was walking around with your neighbor friends with like a glass of wine and you're watching the kids and, and like, that's not ideal. So like, but for the, 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 the little kids who, who want to be out there, you know, in their costumes, having neighbors ooh and ah over them. And it's a nice way to connect with your neighbors. Like, you know, I think it's, I think it's doable. If you, if you play by the rules, wear the mask, you know. Yeah. I mean, you can have your own little, I mean, like, like your own little wand and you hit the doorbell and the, the idea is you walk back six feet. Yeah. And, you know, and you just say, hi, I, I'm sure there are people more creative than I who are more steeped in the joys of Halloween. Uh, you can figure it out, but I'm sure there's a way to figure it out. Absolutely. Um, Another question here, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. When we have a guest over, social distancing, do we need to have separate hors d'oeuvres or is that not necessary? I, mean, I have a gut reaction to it, no pun intended. I think honestly, it's fine to have the same food. I would actually just keep them in separate places, right? If, 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 if the host wants to put out the food a little bit before the guests arrive, 
my bigger concern, honestly, and what I've seen in certain distance gatherings is not, it's not the concern about the food contamination. It's about what the flow looks like. If two people are coming to the food at the same time, um, so I would, my guess is it's, it's fine to have the same food, but I would create separate plates that the two groups can, can go to. I think it's a good point. It's like, it's like everything. I mean, it's, it's the commingling that's the big issue. Right. Like when we're talking about sports teams, right? It's, 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 it's like the sports teams, they didn't get the, the, they didn't get COVID from playing football necessarily. They got it from hanging out in the locker room together. So same thing with a cocktail party. It's not so much from the food. It's from the commingling at the cheese platter. Yeah. Um, Okay, one last one here. How do you cope with the fact that it seems like every symptom can be COVID? Every one or two weeks, we have someone in our house that has a headache, GI issues, scratchy throat. Um, yeah, I mean, it's winter um, and we're starting to see some of these rhinoviruses and um, other sort of respiratory viruses circulating. I had a patient with strep today. Um, you know, and so it, how do you, well, I think this is where you need to see, you need to have a doctor someone you can call and run these things by. Um, and then I think you need to always err on the side of caution and know that if you have had any exposure that you, you, you could have COVID because COVID can manifest itself as nothing, right? You can have no symptoms. It can also be a head cold. It can be cough, shortness of breath, loss of smell. It can be diarrhea. So I think it's really important to have a doctor um, and talk it through with your, with your physician. Yeah, I mean, I think the Yes, and I've, I just, another question came in, and I'm not sure what it's going back to. And the other to. thing is allergies are yeah, allergies. Yeah, are yeah, allergies right now. Honestly, early on in the pandemic, I said, everybody who's got seasonal allergies, please just start taking your prophylactic take, allergy meds. Totally. Start taking Claritin, Allegra, Flonase. Just, Flonase, do it. Uh, saline rinse. Be aggressive yeah. on that. I yeah. think you know, when you're catching strep throat or you get another cold, you have to wonder, what did I do wrong? Maybe you got lucky you didn't catch COVID. Um, but you had to catch it through contact with somebody. And it is really tough on the parents with the young kids who may be going back to school and what do they get and what are those viruses that are circulating that are non-COVID viruses. It's not easy and this is gonna be a messy fall in that regard, but be careful, talk to your doctor, treat the most likely things. And if you need to get tested for COVID, get tested for COVID. Yep. Um, Dr. Agley Clay, thank you so much for joining me and thanks for everybody for watching and we'll do this again. We'll do our eighth Q&A with Lucy and Clay in a couple weeks. All right. Look forward to it. All thanks, right. Lucy. Bye guys. Thanks for All joining right. us. See ya.